Well, thank you, John. Thank you, Letha and PopTech. Um, we have been looking forward to being here all year. And so what we're going to do this afternoon, and I just want to make sure I know where, there's my clock. OK. Um, um, we're going to have a conversation up here for about 45, 50 minutes. And then we will open it up uh, for a conversation with you for a little while, and then bring it back up here to close. And we have a good long time, relatively speaking. And what we're going to do in this next 75 minutes is delve into the human aspect of rebellion, um, the inner life of rebels. And that is a complicated and sometimes messy space. Um, the icons in living memory who come most readily to mind when we use the word rebellion, you know, they have a mixed legacy. Um, they and their accomplishments are not always generative, not always resilient, to use a wonderful word that Andrew Zolli and PopTech have helped disseminate in the world. You could argue, to be a provocateur, that there's a straight line to draw between the weary aftermath of the 1960s and the cynical best and brightest who brought us the worst of the hedge funds. The history of rebellion is also littered with burnout, which my guest Parker Palmer has, I think, helpfully defined. He's defined burnout as violating my own nature in the name of nobility. And the darkest side of many rebellions of the past has also include, included futures in which the rebels then turn around and imitate the very injustices they overturned. Then you have the irony of this moment that we inhabit, where people like us, everybody in this room, is freer psychologically and practically to be a rebel. Um, but the forms and institutions we are dealing with don't need smashing. Most of them are imploding all on their own, <laughs> right? And so many of our acts of rebellion um, and all of the rebellion we've been hearing about here are in the first instance acts of creation. But rebellion as an act of meaningful creation in human terms, and I even use the one, want to use the word spiritual, um, which I think is a very expansive word and a wonderful word in the 21st century. That may be something importantly different, as Courtney Martin has written, from the mantra that many of us grew up internalizing that our job was to save the world. If this generation does rebellion differently, generatively, resiliently, I think it will be in part because of a new redemptive commitment that I'm aware of in the world that is very much on display here at PopTech to connect inner life and outer life, inner work and social change, to be reflective and activist at once, to be in service as much as in charge, and to be wise in learning from elders and from history while bringing very new realities into being for this age. Courtney Martin and Parker Palmer are two of the wisest thinkers I know, and they're two of the wisest teachers I know, on two places across the generational spectrum about the work and the gift of creating transformative, life-giving structures for our world by becoming transformed, life-giving people. And Something that I've been longing for and I thought we might indulge in here, kind of, you know, well into the conference, is a definition of terms, you know, the word rebellion. <clears throat> and so I want to start um, by asking the two of you to talk about what that word rebellion connotes for you. I mean, what your life experience has brought you to think about when you think about rebellion. And to re reflect on that a little bit in terms of, you know, where you started where you came from. And, I, and I, I'd like to start with you, Parker. Parker was born in 1939, which means, if I can still count, that you were 21 in 1960. You came of age in the middle of America, in the Midwest, in the 1950s. You went on to do graduate work at Berkeley and to become a community organizer in Washington, D.C. in the 1960s. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, you know, I think for me, uh, awakening into rebellion was a slow process, certainly to be born in the 50s in a white upper middle class suburb of Chicago as I was, was to uh, labor under the illusion that all was right with the world. Um, my first wake up call came when I went to Union Theological Seminary in New York City for a year until God spoke to me and said he wanted me to get the hell out of the church. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so he sent me to Berkeley, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Where I spent most of the 60s. And that was, you know, a huge education in the streets as well as in the classroom. In fact, more in the streets than in the classroom. And, I went there thinking I'd become a college professor. Why else would one suffer the indignity of getting a PhD? Um, but um, by the end of the 60s, with the cities burning and my heroes having been assassinated, I went to Washington, D.C. and became a community organizer working on issues of racial justice. Five years later, I realized that I was trying to lead people towards something that I had never really experienced for myself, namely community. And so I went for what I thought was a sabbatical year, but ended up to be 11 years of my life, to a place called Pendle Hill near Philadelphia, which is an intentional Quaker community that's arranged kind of like an ashram, kind of like a kibbutz, kind of like a commune, kind of like a monastery, but sex was okay. <laughs> uh, and, and lived there under conditions of radical equality with a PhD from Berkeley, I was Dean of Studies, but I made ex the exact same base salary as an 18-year-old coming to cook in the kitchen or work in the garden because he or she didn't know what to do next, and that base salary was $2,400 a year plus room and board. Um, living under those conditions for over a decade, um, uh, I think, changed me in ways that I am still trying to understand, but one of the one of the great gifts it brought to me in the middle of struggle was an understanding that the value of a person has absolutely nothing to do with status, power, income, leverage. It had everything to do with what was here, what was here, and how it came out into the world in what I have come to call life on the Mobius strip. And I'll just finish this up by saying that I think one of my discoveries on this journey is that we all live on the Mobius strip, which is this very fascinating form that has no, it has only one surface. There is no inner and outer. So when, when I think about the relation of the inner and outer life, it poses me with a little bit of a conceptual problem, since I have the Mobius strip image in mind, um, where whatever is on the inside is flowing continually to the outside, and I have choices to make about that, we all do and whatever is on the outside flows back on the inside, and we have choices to make about how to appropriate that. But the point is, we're constantly shaping reality and sh the world and shaping ourselves in a simultaneous act of life on the Mobius strip. And I, these are the things that have, have led me to rebel against um, the standard images of why people are or are not valuable, uh, how it is we're, we're called to live together rather than apart, um, what it means to change the world, which is something that can be done on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, as well as in establishing organizations, uh, creating inventions, et cetera, et cetera. Courtney, what does rebellion come to mean for you, and where did you start with that? Um, well, you know, I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is a, a really religiously conservative town. And but I grew up with these progressive parents who were sort of a product of, of the that social movement era. I grew up with stories about my parents taking over the student union and getting beer in the student union, which to them seemed very important. In addition to like um, diversifying the student body and all these things, but my dad used to always jokingly say, you know, we wanted to change the world, and instead we just got rich which you know, was sort of tongue in cheek. We weren't exactly rich, but we were comfortably middle class. And I think once my parents sort of you know, grew up and, and became, um, we became a family, a lot of their really radical ideas 
got, got sort of buried under the daily practical um, realities of what they had to deal with. And so I kind of grew up with this sense of rebellion as, as kind of my um, both birthright and birth burden, that somehow you know my parents had these big ideas and they in some ways were able to realize them, but in a lot of ways didn't. And so here I was, you know, this was now something I needed to, to carry on with me. And I think I really internalized that in a deep way. Um, but, but what I sort of came of age, especially in college and post-college thinking about, was that the script around rebellion that I had inherited, not just from my parents, but sort of the world at large, was too simplistic. It was too flattened out as kind of a white, privileged American. It was this save the world rhetoric that we, you referenced. Um, and who, who are you saving, right, in that scenario? And, and, and why do they need saving? And what form of saving? And there was just sort of all of these scripts that I'd heard my whole life. And I'd, I'd glommed on to, because I was an altruistic person who thought, yeah, I want to live a life of meaning. Um, and yet, they were so problematic. And so I think as I left college, I became very disillusioned with a lot of what I'd heard, both about the world at large, but also about my role in it, sort of questioning who am I to save anyone, and, and what is that all about? So it, it pushed me to think more deeply about rebelling against scripts, sort of the, and that's on the intellectual level, but also rebelling emotionally. Um, one of the things I feel like my parents really entrusted me with was this idea that you should trust your own outrage. And so there have been so many, all of like the most important some moments in my life have been moments when I was outraged about something, and it felt like, Everybody else is kind of going, oh, it's, it's all right. It's not a big deal. And, and sort of being able to honor that anger, to me, is, is one of the most important muscles of a rebel, um, is using your own kind of emotional life, um, valuing it, and using it to, to sort of push you to do things in the world that feel truly important, as opposed to the script you're hearing of what's important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you've written about your generation, you said that we are the most wanted, educated, diverse generation in history and the most conscious of complexity. Um, and that one of the things you came to understand also as you became a journalist is that doing social justice entails a huge psychological risk. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you would explain what you mean by that, what you discovered there. I think, you know, I've, I've heard that phrase about the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Yeah, and Oliver I, Wendell. Yeah, Holmes, and yes. I have such deep respect for that idea. Like, that to me is what I crave more than anything. Is, and I think part of why Parker's writing is so beautiful and has influenced me so much is he is such a genius at the simplicity on the other side of complexity. But that is hard earned. And I think that's part of what I mean is, you know, there are really simple ways to be a just force in the world. And I think they are you know, honoring the dignity of each human being you encounter, et cetera. But there's so many complexities uh, also. And so it's about like if you're trying to create systemic change, you have to think about all those complexities. And you have to think about yourself humbly within those complexities. Um, and that is exhausting. And in some ways, it's, it's dangerous. Because when you, when you really want to embrace complexity, it's very easy to feel like, well, then I should just stay home and mind my own business because this is way too hard and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in it and I'm actually not going to help people. And I've had moments in my life where I've felt that way of just totally paralyzed. Um, but there's such a powerlessness in that too. So I think there's something, you have to have this like robustness around holding that complex, complexity and, and being able to acknowledge that it's kind of beyond your comprehension, and yet you still have to keep trying to do it and do it in the most ethically honorable way. You know right. what I, mean? I, think, I think you've pointed out that for your generation in particular, but I don't think this is just restricted to any generation now. We're so bombarded with facts and details and complexity, and usually the dark side of the complexity, mm -hmm. right, which is what comes to us as news for the most part. Um, and that whereas, you know, your generation in particular is accused of being apathetic, disengaged. You know, you're saying, you know, you're, you're, people are just overwhelmed. Yeah. That in fact, that very empathy um, it becomes a liability because right. of what's laid upon it. Absolutely, and and I think there's another part of our generation um, that I'm critical of that. And, and it's largely surrounds around this term social entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. you know, which is like a sexy way to say a lot of what we're trying to say. But 
is this sort of magic bullet idea of social change. Like there are a lot of young people who will found a nonprofit organization or a B Corp or whatever they think is the cool thing to do and say, you know, we've figured out the solution to healthcare globally and this is what it is. Um, and I understand that instinct because I had it. It's this instinct to when you have so much privilege um, and you don't want to sit around feel, feeling guilty, you want to do something productive with it to want to run out there and, and make solutions happen. But the, the dark side of that instinct is that it, it just doesn't acknowledge that complexity and it can use a lot of resources in a way that ultimately is not benefiting or honoring the, the humanity of the people that you are supposedly trying to help. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, on the complexity subject, um, I think Courtney has said some very important things. The only thing I'd want to add, and I know Courtney is on this page too, she and I do a lot of work together, and I've been very influenced by her book, Do It Anyway, which, yeah. which helped me understand that my generation did it because they wanted to save the world, and when within five years the world hadn't changed one whit, and, had, and there'd been a lot of blowback, they gave up on that and turned to something banal or worse. Um, I want to throw in the word community. I mean, I think complexity <clears throat> it ha can only be held by community. Mm. And, and I think that one of the most important things that needs to happen right now is, if I, if I may say so, by at your invitation being modeled right here, which is intergenerational community. Um, I, a few years ago, invited Courtney and a bunch of her friends who are some of the most remarkable people I've ever met, these 30-something folk who, who are doing it anyway and who give to me every sign that they're in it for the long haul, not just for the short ride. I invited them to my home in Madison, Wisconsin, to help me and some of my colleagues at the little nonprofit I founded, the Center for Courage and Renewal, um, understand the digital revolution and how, it might, how our work might be enhanced and amplified through that, because my generation knows very little about that. I got this thing about six months ago and I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I've crossed over to the, the, promise, the promised land and, and it ain't all it's cracked up to be. But, uh, so we, we spent three days in, in the living room and I was learning so much and I remember saying to them, you may, may remember this, Courtney, at one point I said, you know, at age, what was I, 70 at the time, 75 now, I said, I feel like I'm standing somewhere down the curvature of the earth. I cannot see the horizon that you folks see where you're standing higher on that curvature. I need your eyes and I need your ears and I need you to tell me what it is you're seeing because that same horizon is coming at me even though I don't know it. Mm -hmm. I, and then I added, and I need you to speak clearly and distinctly because... <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, my point is that I'm standing here having, quote, figured a lot of things out through 75 years of, of, of education, social engagement, risk-taking, rebellion, although I think you can claim the rebel status only in retrospect and only very lightly, because as soon as you start thinking in this moment consciously, I'm a rebel, mm -hmm. you screw it all up. Uh, I, I, I do believe this, you know, these, this self-labeling is dangerous stuff. Just do what you do. I mean, the bird doesn't think, I'm a bird, I can fly. Why, you know, I, I, what am I doing sitting here on a branch? They just, you know, they, they do what they do. And, and so I, I have my frameworks, which is, I need not only their eyes and ears, I need to get inside their heads and hearts and see what that new framework is that can help me interpret that data better than I'm able to do. The danger at age 75 is to think you have everything figured out. And I would just say one more thing about Courtney's wonderful emphasis on humility. My last book is called Healing the Heart of Democracy, and in that book I talk about five habits of the heart borrowing a phrase from Alexis de Tocqueville that I think we need to get our democracy back in a citizen movement. But when I give talks about it, I say, if, if five is too many for you to hold on to, you really only need two. You need chutzpah and humility. Mm. You, know, you, need, you need the chutzpah to know that you have a voice worth speaking and things worth saying. And you need the humility to know that it's vital to listen because you may not have 
it right at all or only a very partial grasp on the truth. So I think it's in holding these paradoxes that we start to sort things out. We, we, it, there's so much of this life that we're all trying to live that's just not about either or, yeah. even though we've been trained to think in binary code, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean that in the larger sense, the metaphorical sense of that term. It's both and. You know, I breathe in and I breathe out. I really, it would really be dangerous for me to say, I think I'm basically a breathing out kind of guy, so that's <laughs> how I, what I'm gonna you know, devote my life to. Um, I am an individual with a voice. I am also embedded in a community on which I'm ex highly dependent, from which I came and to which I will return. And I include the community of the natural world in that. And, and I need both the chutzpah and the humility to be there fully, to be there now, and to be there in a life-giving way. You know, I, I think you, you just, without using the word vocation, the, the way you talked about rebellion was about, you know, doing, doing what you do, pursuing your calling. Rebellion, uh, not as a label, but as, as a vocation, as a way of being in the world. I mean, and this is language you use a lot. I, I think it's so much more generous and interesting than the language of careers and job titles, which is also how we've narrowly defined ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that, about, you know, and, 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 and something that you both write about and think about so much is, um, well, you know, even though, Parker, you can talk about the Mobius strip and it's a beautiful image, but, but being completely integrated, being the same on the inside and the outside is the work of a lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. It's the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what comes to mind for me is is that I I have created this career, which you know, when I was young, I was watching both of my parents. My dad was a lawyer, and he put on a suit and he went to work, and I thought he had a very important job. And my mom was a million things, all of them sort of confusing, like um, you know, doing social work, obviously raising us, accidentally founding a million things, the Jungian Society, like these things that I later found out. I'm like, my mom founded that too? She founded a film festival when I was a little girl because she sort of did an analysis of the community and realized it was really narrow and conservative. And if she wanted her kids to grow up with a broader view of the world, she had to figure out some way to kind of super boost some culture in there. And having never made a film, never you know, started a film festival. She just said, I'm gonna start a film festival. So she and this other woman in my community started it. It's not the longest running women's film festival in the world. Mm -hmm. So I grew up watching films and, and seeing my mom do this kind of community activist work. And, and meanwhile, the whole time I'm thinking, you know, the feminist thing is for me to have a career like my dad, right? I'm gonna have the serious <laughs> right. career, the one where you put on the suit and you go to work and you get paid a lot of money. And, and lo and behold, I created a career exactly like my mom. It's called totally different things. It's called a portfolio career. Because that, you know, is fancy and makes everyone feel okay about it. But, but it's, it's totally confused, just like my mom's career. It doesn't fit on one business card. Um, and, and for me, that's about not putting on the business suit. Like, I, I have this incredible privilege of showing up as myself, speaking of the Mobius strip, in every part of my work life. That doesn't mean there are certain moments when I have to shape shift to figure out like how can I create the most change within this institution w in which I don't necessarily feel totally at home. That happens. But um, I have this honor of living my life that way. And, and so when I think about the future of work, it's largely around this question is, you know, by 2050, I think it is, the majority of people will be freelance and contingent workers. There are really negative things about that. Um, but the really positive piece of that is that people are creating work lives out of totally new material. Right, but I also think vocation is not just about your work life. I mean, that's the thing. We've so defined ourselves and our place in the world by the work we did, the things we got paid for, the title we had. Um, and people are having to create their lives. And, I mean, you know, parenting is a vocation. The mm. volunteer work you do, you do can be part. I mean, the, your vocation is yeah. who you are in the world, and it's bigger than, than the job you do. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely, and I know Courtney agrees with that yeah. as well, because her, her life is very put together that way yes. on, on every level. Um, you know, uh, back in the day when people would ask me, so you have this PhD from Berkeley and you've gotten offers from three great universities and you're off to Washington to become a community organizer, and then you're off to live for 11 years with a bunch of granola hippies, um, you know, who sit in silence every morning 
and nobody can explain what they're doing, what, is, what, what kind of career is that? Why are you doing this to yourself? I had three kids, um, you know, I wasn't making money. And I have a very vivid memory that uh, language that stays with me to this day, which I, to me sort of equates with the word vocation. The reason I'm doing it is that I can't not do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Am I wild crazy about taking these risks, financial, reputational, uh, in terms of status and all of that stuff that was as important to me as it was to anyone else of my generation, which was slowly eroded by 11 years at Pendle Hill living under these conditions of radical equality, including economic equality, which is a very important piece of the puzzle in this society. Am I thrilled to be doing this? Absolutely not. Uh, people think I'm crazy and I feel crazy half the time. But one thing I knew for a certainty down to my bones was that I couldn't not do it. And to me, that's a sure sign of vocation. And you, 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 you persist on that path with what you can't not do. Mm. Uh, you can talk about calling, whatever. But you know, one of, one of the lines I live by is we're all trying to figure out what we're, what we're supposed to do with our lives. I think the, more, the prior, more important question is, what is your life trying to do with you? Um, I do believe that there is something called my life that is embedded deeply in me that is independent of my ego, my aspirations, um, my programming, to, you know, to say nothing of my programming and, and the cultural expectations around me. And to me, it's been very valuable guidance to, 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 to to be invited to sit quietly, um, to reflect, to do whatever it takes. Uh, I, I have a definition of contemplation, which is contemplation is any way you have of penetrating illusion and touching reality. You don't have to sit cross-legged. You don't have to chant a mantra. One of the most contemplative people I know is a woman raising a child with severe developmental disability who has to live her life and that child's life. And she loves that child with a passion. And in the raising of that child, she has penetrated every cruel illusion this society has about what makes a human being worthwhile. And when I'm with her, I feel that gift being given to me. So any way you have of penetrating illusion about yourself, about the world, and touching reality, that's, that's contemplation. But if you can't not do it, then you stay with it. I'll just tell a quick vocational story, because for me, humor is another form of contemplation. My mother died at age 93 about 10 years ago, and she spent the last decade of her life being totally baffled by how I made my living. Um, my dad had a title. He had a company. He reported to an office. He put on a suit and tie every morning. I had a post office box in Madison, Wisconsin, and nothing that would fit on a business card. So I visited her towards the end of her life, and she says, Parker, you've got to tell me one more time, <laughs> because I'm worried, and a lot of my friends are worried. <laughs> I think she was worried that I was going to move into her basement. Uh, how, do you how do you make your living? And she's, you got a picture of this. She's sitting there in her wingback chair with her cane planted in the carpet, looking for all the world like the queen of Romania, uh, <laughs> lacking only a tiara, really. And I said, OK, Mom, I'll try, I'll try again. I, I write books and articles, which are a kind of form of talking to people about things I care about, hoping that they will care about them, too. Sometimes people read those books and articles, and they invite me to come and give a lecture or a workshop or a retreat about those things. So I, then I can talk to them face to face. And then I kind of just ran out of gas. I said, you know, Mom, that's about all I can tell you about how I make my living. So she thought for a minute and said, so Parker, you make your living by talking with people. Is that right? I said, yes. <laughs> she thought for a moment and said, well, I don't mind talking to you, but I certainly wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, every now and then I say, thank you, mom. That was, that was cool. See, the, the humility, she's keeping coming yeah, there, right? Right, yeah. right? So there's a phrase of Thomas Merton that in everything there is a hidden wholeness that you both have reflected on in your writing. And I wonder if you'd just talk a little bit about um, 
what you think that has to say to 21st century people? Mm. And with, the, with this theme of rebellion kind of in mind. Well, I think it's an act of rebellion to be a whole person, right? It's an act of rebellion to show up as your whole self, and especially the, the parts that are complex, that are unfinished, that are vulnerable, um, you know, in part because of the internet, and we're talking about sort of living online versus living on land, and who you, sh who you sort of curate yourself to be, et cetera. I think there's been never been more pressure um, to kind of parcel yourself to, you know, Irvin Goffman, the sociologist, talked about sort of these performative selves, and I feel like it's like it's never been more um, kind of asked of us to show up as only slices of ourselves in different places. So I think even just to, to feel like you're showing up as your whole self in different settings is a, is a pretty rebellious act. Um, but I also think it's, it's really something deeper about um, acknowledging those sort of not letting the, the society or system give you a script that makes you feel comfortable. Discomfort was mentioned earlier, and I think it's, not, it's a word that probably hasn't come up enough over the course of our time together, is um, that we're in a time that I think can create too much comfort if you let it. And so there's something about being whole but being uncomfortable in that wholeness and like holding those things together. Do you know what I mean, Parker? I'm trying to like grapple at what, what the relationship between discomfort and wholeness is. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think you're right on target, Courtney. I, you know, I, I, I was listening to you with great appreciation and thinking, I love your phrase, you know, it's, a, it's an act of rebellion to show up as someone trying to be whole, and I would add, as someone who believes that there is a hidden wholeness beneath the very evident brokenness of our, of our world. And somebody who wants to say that somehow part of that hidden wholeness is love, part of that hidden wholeness is our fellow feeling for each other, part of that hidden wholeness is a desire to make this thing work and to work it out together. Um, you know, in, in six or seven years ago, I published this book on democracy, and I, I was immediately thrown into a very deep aquifer of cynicism. That, that healing the heart of democracy. Healing the heart of democracy, right, and thrown into this aquifer of cynicism about, are you kidding? You know, and given the state of things, given the way our system is run by big money, given the disempowerment of the average citizen, you've got to be out of your head. And, you know, as always, part of you feels, well, maybe I am crazy. And to the, act, the act of persisting in, in those fundamental beliefs that something better is possible and that, and that you're willing I mean, here, here I think is, here's, I think this is courage, and I try to call myself to it every day, and I often fail. You don't have much to offer, but you're willing to put your, your piece on the table as if this were a potluck supper, right, that mm -hmm. we were building, that we were creating together. And if everybody keeps bringing a, a hot dish or whatever the East Coast equivalent of that is, pretty soon we'll have a meal that will we'll, we'll feed everyone. So it, rebellion can be that very small thing of swimming upstream against a tide of cynicism or against a tide of scarcity and, and trying to witness to that in your life day in and day out. And it can really, really make you hurt. As I've said in my writing and in my talking, three times in my adult life, I have been plunged into deep depression for six, eight months at a time. There's a cost to be paid. Uh, depression isn't the cost that everyone pays, but I'm working with some people now in the world of internet uh, startups who are very, very concerned about the rash of suicides that happened a few years ago among uh, relatively young and some middle-aged internet startup folks where the success rate is only 10%, and a lot of money is at stake, and a lot of people's jobs are at stake, and they've taken this all on themselves, and they're not getting any sleep, and they can't find any peace. And I, I know from my own journey where that goes, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, it goes into deep darkness from which some people don't recover. So, you know, we really need to be talking with each other about these things. 
Um, depression, although it's talked about more than it was in the 50s, is still a taboo subject in our society, especially among, quote, successful people. And it, we need to stop that. Uh, we need to go public with it because we, we are each other's healthcare workers. Yeah, and I think, and, and not just uh, people who are successes, but, but people who are trying to make a difference in the world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, Do It Anyway grew out of an experience for me, which was, you know, leaving college. I went to Barnard College, and I was kind of pumped up on my human rights education. I wanted to go do something in the world. This is 2002. And you know, it was a really rough time to be yeah. a young, idealistic person who right. wanted to. You were senior in high, senior in college, uh, starting your senior year when September 11th happened. Right? Yeah, experienced September 11th, and then you know, I was part of the anti-war marches. I woke my friends up out of their hungover stupor and said, "Like, you're coming to this march with me." And they're like, "Courtney," because huh. I mean, that's another thing: is the rebellion is sort of square these days. Like, if you make your friends <laughs> go to marches, they're like, "Really, marches are not going to make the change." And I'm like, "No, we got to be there. We got to be." Bothered. Bodies on the street, and then you know okay, it's called a focus group. But that's an interesting dialogue for us to be having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, and then President Bush called it a focus group, and and we all know what what happened, and it's still happening. And so, I actually got to this place of deep desperation. I wouldn't call it depression necessarily because I haven't had the same kind of clinical experience, but. But I had this, I, actually very funny, my family went to this d totally depressing documentary, which is our favorite thing to do when we all get together. It's really <laughs> a lovely tradition. Um, and we, we came home and it, you know, we were all totally upset. And I said, you know, I've had this fantasy of lighting myself on fire on the White House steps, like writing a letter about why war is wrong and lighting myself on fire. And, and I realized it was totally overdramatic and ridiculous, but it was speaking to this thing of like, here's like a, a white woman in America with a safety net and all kinds of privilege, and I feel so powerless that that's what I want to do. Like something's going on, is going on here, mm -hmm. and that's when I started to deconstruct the narratives I was holding on to and the ideas I had about what successful rebellion looked like. Right, like I wanted to do the march and have the war stop. I wanted to canvas for the, the president I wanted to win, and I wanted him to win. Like, I had this very transactional relationship with the idea of rebellion. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I understood through that, that emotional low was that I needed to reorient myself, have a totally different relationship with a rebellion that would last me a lifetime, and, and was honoring of the lifetimes of rebellion that have come before me. That <laughs> here I thought I was just gonna like graduate and head out into the world and like be super efficient. Um, I'm a little suspicious of efficiency, in part because I crave it so much, and I think that that's a very generational thing. It's like we're really obsessed with efficiency, and emotions aren't efficient, and I think rebellion in many ways isn't efficient mm. and never will be. Mm. Mm. Parker, there's something that you, you wrote uh, a piece about the modern violence of overwork, mm. um, which is a wonderful phrase, and I think it applies not only to overwork in the in the literal sense of how we do our jobs, but also to this, to this overextension of what we can achieve mm -hmm. in everything we do. Um, I'm just gonna read it, it's, it's wonderful. Um, there is a pervasive form of modern violence to which the idealist most easily succumbs, activism and overwork. The rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form of its innate Violence. The frenzy of the activist neutralizes his or her work. It destroys the fruitfulness of his or her work because, because it kills the root of inner wisdom which makes work fruitful. And then you, you talk about how this came to you the hard way as, a, as an activist who burned out. And you said, um, there's a critical question that you ask yourself. What, what do I need to do right now to tend the root of inner wisdom that makes work fruitful, and I think fruitful mm -hmm. not necessarily being synonymous with efficient right. or even effect, uh, evidently effective. Right. So um, just uh, to be clear, the first part of what you read actually comes from <coughs> Thomas Merton, oh, okay. uh, who's one of my heroes, and from Douglas Steer, who, oh. from whom Merton got it, so we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So. Um, but I love the quote, I, I love the, the insight, and I do try to ask myself on a regular basis, and sometimes I lose the need for the question, what do I need to do right now uh, to make the, the, 
the root to water, the root of, of inner wisdom that, that makes work fruitful. And I will say that one of the things that I think about a lot, I mean, I could talk about practices I have, like walking in the woods, or reading a lot of poetry, or sitting in silence alone or with, with other people. Um, those are helpful to me in sort of letting the water still and coming back to myself and learning more about what it is, where it is my life is taking me rather than where I want to take my life. I, but there are some important frames around that for me, and I'll mention just one of them. We are in a society that is obsessed with effectiveness, with outcomes, with results, and efficiency is very much attached to that, um, <clears throat> which Courtney wisely pointed to. So uh, I, I want to be clear that, uh, that I'm not against effectiveness and getting results. I work hard on writing books or on creating a nonprofit and on propagating programs through our 220 facilitators around the country. I want that work to be effective, just as everyone in this room wants to be effective. But I am very clear for myself that the tighter we cling to the norm of effectiveness, the smaller and smaller tasks we're going to take on, because they're the only ones with which you can be effective. And I give you, as case in point, what's going on in public education in this country. We are no longer interested in educating a child. We're interested in getting that child to pass tests, because that's a task with which we can be effective, right? And, and get measurable results. Every good teacher knows that educating a child is infinitely more complex than <clears throat> getting them to pass a test and that it, the results may not show up for 10, 20, 30 years. I still have the experience at age 75 of saying, oh, that's what Philip Selznick was trying to teach me at Berkeley, right? Or that's what Gertrude Neuwirth was trying to teach me at Carleton. I, I still wake, awaken to those teachings now that I have an experiential context in which they come alive. So the question for me is not, get rid of, of effectiveness or results. They're important. But there has to be a standard that trumps effectiveness. And I have a word that I use for myself that helps me walk this path. Um, and that's the word faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Faithfulness has to trump effectiveness. And I don't mean anything high and mighty about that. Remember, I'm the guy that God kicked out of seminary. <laughs> uh, by faithfulness, I mean, am I being faithful to my own gifts? Am I being faithful to the needs I see around me within my reach? And am I being faithful to those points at which my gifts might intersect those needs in some life-giving way? Um, you know, at age 75, I think about my mortality more than I did when I was 35 or 45. And one of the things that's very, very clear to me is that when I'm drawing my last breath, I will not be asking, did I sell enough books? Did I get enough good, good enough reviews? Um, are, what do the numbers look like, you know? Uh, did I meet the quarterly, de quarterly uh, norms or whatever the, you, you call them? I'm not good on business models. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be asking, did I show up in this world as fully at myself as I knew how? Given my limitations, given my fallibilities, cutting myself a lot of slack for my failure to do so, did I use my limited lifetime to show up fully as I knew how with what I've got? That's what I call faithfulness. And I think, I think there's, there, it, it's a matter of framing mm -hmm. what we're doing as well as those particular practices like walking in the woods, like silence, like reading poetry that can bring us back to those, those points that you might call true north. Mm -hmm. So I really think I'd like to just open this up now and see what's on your mind and what you might want to discuss with these two. Um, we, the, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and someone will come to you. Um, I'm going to do my radio thing. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, in a cross-generational conversation with thinkers and writers, Parker Palmer and Courtney Martin. We're at the 2014 Pop Tech Conference in Camden, Maine, with the theme of rebellion. 
So, do we have anyone here, up here? Hi, um, just going back to the uh, discussion that we started a little bit around discomfort and you know, what, what does that really mean for us? Uh, for me, you know, discomfort is when I learn the most about myself and, and people around me and it feels like, you know, society itself is always trying to, you know, stop that feeling of discomfort and just get your perspective on it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's Piaget, right? The educational philosopher says there's a, a, a sort of perfect amount of discomfort for learning. So your experience is, is really proven out. I, I think about one moment when I was most uncomfortable was actually um, when I got my first book deal. I was 25 and I had this total Cinderella story where you know people thought I was gonna write the next bestseller. It was not a bestseller, I'm very proud of it. but. Um, there was an auction among all these publishing houses and, and I got this advance and all of a sudden I was going to have money. And, and I was 25 years old, living with a bunch of artists of different kinds, none of us had money, and all of a sudden I was going to have money and I was deeply uncomfortable with the idea that somehow I was going to be the one with money. Why, like, why did I deserve it? And, you know, so I went to my dad and said, you know, I'm thinking about what to do with this. He said, put it in a savings account. Somehow you followed my advice to follow your bliss, and now you're a writer, and I'm totally freaked out about your financial future. <laughs> Save it all, right? Um, I, I was at the bar with friends having beers, and I'd be like, I don't know what to do with this money. I got this money. And they're all like, give it to me. Screw you, you know? <laughs> so I was having so much discomfort, and the only thing I learned to do at moments like that when I'm so uncomfortable is to share my confusion with others and look to people who are more resilient and, and, and sort of more robust than I am. So I did this thing where I gave 10 friends $100 and I said, come to this bar a month from now, give away this money in some way, come to the bar a month from now and tell the story of what you did. And, and people came, and, and we called it the Secret Society for Creative Philanthropy because we wanted to make it feel fun and covert. And people did wild things. I mean, they had strangers at bookstores buy each other their favorite book and take these funny Polaroids, and people made $100 worth of lasagna and you know, all kinds of random stuff. But it was the most joyful night for me because it was a way of, of being in confusion in community, getting back to this idea, and in, in, in discomfort in relationships but doing that in a way that felt like I could share it. I think discomfort sometimes comes from really productive, like intellectual and emotional fog, but also comes from disconnection from other people. So when we're in that discomfort, getting back in relationship can be so important. That, that's a beautiful answer. All I want to add to it is that when I learned about the secret society for creative philanthropy, that's when I realized I got to meet this woman. I love this woman. <laughs> Um, and I could use a few bucks myself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that and the, and the point at which, just to be totally transparent, a friend emailed me and said, do you realize that there's a woman blogging about you on a website called Feministing? <laughs> and I thought, I'm in really deep oatmeal here. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a Quaker term. I don't want to lose your <laughs> technicalities. <laughs> So I reached out to Courtney and said, let's talk. And it was one of the best uh, things I've ever done. Mm. There's one. Hi, my name is Emily. And um, what an honor to get to listen in to your conversation today. Picking up a little bit on the theme, um, I'm curious. I think we all develop out of necessity the tools for navigating our inner and outer worlds, and you've spoken very eloquently on that. But I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about any ways in which I, both of you have learned to do that in community and some of the, the ways that we can actually replicate that ourselves. Yeah, if I can yeah. I take a crack at that. So um, I wrote a book about it, I hate to pull that. <laughs> Ploy, but uh, it's called A Hidden Wholeness, The Journey Toward an Undivided Life. And in a lot of ways, the central theme of that book is how we create safe spaces for the kinds of conversations that you're referring to and that we've really been talking about up here. Um, one of the things this society is most deficient in is safe spaces for truth telling about the condition of our souls. And if, if the word soul doesn't work for you, it's identity and integrity in the language of secular humanism, 
It's the spark of the divine in the language of Hasidic Judaism. It's big self or true self, uh, big self or no self in the paradoxical language of Buddhism. Uh, everybody has a name for it, different name, and nobody knows its true name. Um, so the, the, I think there is, to use language that's familiar to all of you, although it makes me a little nervous, there is a technology of creating safe space. The reason it makes technology makes me a little nervous is that um, I think at bottom, um, our, this journey is not about techniques. I think it's about existential immersion. Um, in the training of therapists, they have a great phrase that I learned a lot from, technique is what you use until the real therapist shows up. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's really important in, in the midst of a technological conference to remember that there's a substrate of trying to be human that lies beneath any particular methodology. But the methodology for creating safe space is what I tried to write about in the book called A Hidden Wholeness, and it's also what the Center for Courage and Renewal has now been doing with 70,000 people around but the country. Say just a little bit about, I mean, I, I like the phrase spiritual technology, actually, and I think. I know I mean, you used I, it in yeah, the write-up. But I mean, say a little bit about what what the spiritual technology would be for creating safe spaces. Yeah, and if when you, you allow the, us to use When that you language. got the National Humanities Medal, I didn't know if I could argue with you about that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, so, we're old friends, so I can say that. Um, so so uh, I, I, think, I think, first of all, safe space needs a facilitator. I don't think it happens automatically. And I think the role of the facilitator is to keep the, safe, the space safe, even when someone tries to break the safety. I think there are some simple rules, there are some not so simple rules, but one of the simplest is no fixing, no saving, no advising, and no correcting each other. That creates safe space. And when we announce at the beginning of a two-year journey through eight retreats of three days each with a cohort of 25 physicians or 25 K through 12 teachers or 25 whoever, um, and we announce no fixing, no saving, uh, no saving, no advising, no correcting, there's always someone in the group who says, well, what in heaven's name are we going to do mm -hmm. for the next two years? Mm -hmm. You've just taken away the only things we know how to do. Well, what we're gonna do in the absence of those behaviors is we're gonna learn to l listen deeply to each other, and we're going to learn to ask honest, open questions to hear each other into speech which I think is another of the most critical tasks of our time. So many people, unseen, unheard, they need to be heard into speech. How often are you asked a story about your life? It's been happening at this conference, and a lot of safe spaces have, have been created at this conference, which is one of the reasons I admire PopTech so much. The asking of honest, open questions is a high art. We are not gifted at it. it I'm, I've been at it for 25 years and I'm still learning. Um, have you thought about seeing a therapist is not an honest, open question, <laughs> right? And, and, and we love to ask questions like that. Um, so there are things we can, we can do, um, but it's, it, it's, it's a highly, it, it's a discipline. Mm -hmm. It's a discipline. Courtney, you wrote a you wrote a column or a blog somewhere about listening as a social technology for the an innovative did social I, a social innovation did. for the twenty first century. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean I think the point is it it is an art and it but and it's not something that we we have to relearn it. Yeah. We don't have a lot of space mm -hmm. and we don't actually have a lot of practice. The the forms we use to discuss difficult things are not actually about listening. Right. They're sometimes about waiting your turn until the other person that has finished yes, what they have exactly. to say so you can speak, <laughs> yeah. which is not listening. Totally. And I, I think I'm very, I'm actually on the board of the Center for Courage and Renewal, and so I'm deeply invested in, in the practice that Parker's talking about and was part of this group of young activists who got together and went through this process. And I think for a lot of us, what was so jarring in the best possible way was we realized how little of that kind of listening we were doing and how little of that kind of listening we, we were being listened to in that way, how, mm -hmm. how rare that was for us. 
Um, and I, I don't think unless you create those spaces, you don't have a place to grapple with your own power. I mean, we talk about rebelli rebellion and we think about the powerless rebelling against the powerful, right? But the people in this room, you know, are generally holding a lot of power. And where, where are the spaces when you are able to tune in and question how you're actually using that power, whether it's you know, money or time or networks or whatever it is? I think it, it was a, a sort of soul-shaking experience for me to have a moment to pause and go, wow, I've been working so hard to make a life, to be able to pay my rent and, and you know, create a life that like, I haven't paused to go, wow, I actually have a little bit of power now. What am I going to do with that? And, and are the things I'm doing with that in line with, with my ethics and, and who I am in the world. And I think a lot of very powerful people have no time to pause. Mm -hmm. um, they don't create those spaces. And I think some of the most unethical things that happen in the world is because of that cacophony, because there aren't those pauses where people really have to reckon with themselves, not in a like, you're, you're doing something totally corrupt way, but just in a like, is my life energy being used in a way that's useful for the world and in line with my own values? Mm -hmm. There's this, Parker, there's a, you know, I think that the way you talk about the soul as a piece of intelligence in us and a compass, which is distinct from the intelligence of our minds or even of our emotions. Right. Um, and there's a, there's a line of Mary Oliver's poetry. This is the first wildest and wisest thing I know that the soul exists and that it is built entirely out of attentiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that we just, we have to carve, seize space for. Yeah. And I want, I, if I could say, because I know the word soul is hard for some people, I want to say a quick word about how it came to me, because it was one of the rare fruits of that experience in deep darkness called clinical depression. So what happened to me in clinical depression to the extent that I could be aware of myself, which is very hard when you're in that space, was that all of the faculties I had depended on all my life were useless. I could not think my way out of this. My intellect was useless. My ego, which is pretty strong, as are many of the egos in this room, and I mean that in the best possible way, um, was shattered. You lose your sense of self in depression. So that didn't work. My emotions were dead. Depression is not feeling sad. Depression is being unable to feel anything. So the emotions weren't there. And my will was so minuscule as to hardly be noticeable. It involved things like getting up at 10 in the morning instead of 10.30 and keeping that in a journal as if it were a great accomplishment, which it was. I mean, part of what I learned was to value small things in myself. So um, there were moments in that depression when way back in the thickets of my life, I could feel a little stirring like that wild thing, that wild animal that Mary Oliver refers to in the poem. And I came to think of the soul as a wild animal, that little spark, that little stirring that made me think, I can make it one more day. I, don't, I won't kill myself today, because that's where I was on some days. Um, the, what came to me as I emerged from depression was that the, the soul is like a wild animal in two respects. It's very resourceful. It's very savvy. It's very sinewy and strong. It knows how to survive in places where there's very little to eat, um, like an animal in the deep woods. But at the same time, like a wild animal, it's very shy. And we know that the, if we want to see a wild animal, the last thing we should do is go crashing into the woods, shouting for it to come out, right? And yet a lot of our institutional life is like, put it on the table, folks, you know. <laughs> or cross-examining. Yeah, cross-examining it, yeah. it or get, you know, share. Elevator pitch. Yeah, yeah. share or die, you know, <laughs> kind of. Um, and, and so the, the safe space is where the wild animal can put in an appearance. And um, I value it for that reason. Mm-hmm. 
Earlier today, Josh Klein was talking about uh, rebellion through hacking, <clears throat> and he talked about the elegant hack of solving a problem with the fewest amount of code, the, the easiest, quickest solution. You're talking about uh, rebellion and efficiency in a totally different way, uh, and your life's work, and that it will take forever to get to it. So I would just love to hear your perspective on kind of the simplicity or the quickness of the technology side of this rebellion, and also the long-term, the personal side of which you're both coming at it from. Well, good thing I told you what hacking was. Yeah, That's I speak, asked. Huh? I asked. <laughs> I, Parker was like, "Quick definition of hacking!" Right before yeah, we were right, coming out, I was exactly, like, "Oh god!" Right back here, I said, <laughs> "Courtney, what's hacking?" <laughs> Um, I hope you don't mind that I shared that. No, um, I love it, man. I love it. <laughs> I love well, it. Well, I think exactly. Well, first of all, I, when I was hearing that idea of the elegant hack, I was thinking that is the simplicity on the other side of complexity. It's like a, a, a you know, internet version of it or whatever, which is so cool because it's not elegant because it's um, efficient necessarily. I mean, it is it is elegant because it's efficient, but it's after considering all the a million ways that you could do this thing, you do it in the most beautiful, perfectly made way, right? So to me, that is the simplicity on the other side of complexity. But I think because there are these technologies that allow us to scale rebellion or social change or whatever we want to call it much faster further, because we can disrupt markets, as we've been talking about a lot over this conference, it's even more important that we create the spaces we were talking about. Because things can happen so fast, and they do happen so fast, that there aren't a lot of pauses built into the internet age, right? Um, I mean, I think we're even creating them. There's like those apps where you can like shut down your, your internet on your computer and, and like, you know, make sure it won't let you log on to the internet for a while kind of thing. So we're actually starting to figure out ways to pause ourselves through technology. But I think generally the architecture of the internet age does not include a lot of pauses. And I mean, look at this audience when the Wi-Fi is a little slow, myself included, right? right? We're all like refreshing on our, our tweet deck and trying to get things to move faster. So even more reason that these open honest questions and these, these moments of silence and grappling with our own power, we must, we absolutely must build them into our lives. Right, and that architecture is unfolding, right? It's not finished. We are, we are the makers of that. The reason I asked Courtney the question just before we came on was I spent half the morning asking myself, is it possible to hack the soul? Hmm. And then I realized I had no idea what I was thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> I decided I wouldn't use that line when I got out here. <laughs> so you didn't come up with an answer. I didn't, no, I didn't. Well, Parker I, loves language, so I think you were so excited about this new I was. language, yeah. I went off on a real trip this morning. I do want, in my defense, I want, in my defense, and this will make me cool, I know, I do have a Facebook author page. So <laughs> please check it out. I mean, yeah. <laughs> It's not just that I that these two are bringing um, important thoughts and important questions into the world, but I, I think the friendship between them is beautiful, and and I do actually sense that there's a real we've lost we have no we're so we're so segregated by age in this culture. We talk about other kinds of segregation, mm -hmm. but we are segregated by age, and we do have a longing for wisdom and for this cross generational communication. So it's great to have. Both of you here. I want to just um, bring this back up here for the for just a couple more minutes. Um, you know, there's so there's the language of rebellion. There's also the word disruption, which is everywhere now, and innovation. And um, I guess I would just wonder um, quickly, just because we have a few minutes. But you know, what wisdom do you have about you know all innovation is not progress? Right? All disruption and rebellion do not lead to good results. So a little bit of wisdom about how we train ourselves to know the difference, or what are some practices we can have to, to be in that state of discernment, even as we are doing important, wonderful work that we feel called to. Well, for me, and I'm trying to dial down the wisdom meter to just meter out a little bit like you asked for, um, uh, I'm just, trying to figure out how low to set I want, it. I just I mean, want you to be pithy. Do I drool at this okay. point? Anyway. So, so, 
Um, so for me, the word community comes back. I'm, I, I'm terribly interested in the word movement, which is one that I, I, I've heard some talk about, wonderful workshop on movement making yesterday that I attended. Um, would like to hear more talk about that. But a movement is characterized by a community that at its best is a discerning community. And I would say most importantly, a movement community invites its critics into the tent. Um, if, if you don't invite the critics in, if you don't stay uh, open to the critics in a very vulnerable way, you become fascist. Um, fascism kills off its critics, either literally or metaphorically. And so the discernment about where are we going, you have to listen to the critics. They're the ones who can see what you can't see. They're the ones who can pop the bubble that always appears over a movement, making everybody breathe the same air, think the same thoughts, and figure we've got it right and nobody else does. So community is critical to me, and also holding these paradoxes like simplicity and complexity, like chutzpah and humility, mm. like breathing in and breathing out, um, like resting and acting. Um, simple stuff, but we forget to do it. Yeah, I think I would offer you some Parker Palmer words, actually, that have been very meaningful to me, that he, he said something to the effect of that we're whiplash between an arrogant overestimation of ourselves and a servile underestimation of ourselves. And I think the sweet spot is somewhere in between, right? And, and kind of trying to, to stay there as much of the time as you can as you're doing your innovation or your disruption or your rebellion or all these grand things that we might call that. To me, it's really about trying to be in that space in between. And it also is really about feedback. I mean, I think we live in a culture that does not give us a lot of models of, of what it looks like to learn in public. And I've had this many times over as, as someone writing in the feminist space or in other spaces where you know, I'll get feedback and, and my first reaction is sort of a shamed reaction. And then I have to take a deep breath and go, what does it actually look like to A, potentially be wrong um, and integrate some of that feedback, or you know, B, to say, actually, I stand by what I said, and this is how I feel about it. But there's just so few models of that. And I think in our political sphere, we actually call it flip-flopping when yeah. anyone right. shifts what they think about something. And, right. and really, some of my the rebels I respect most did learn in public. You think about Malcolm X or other people who, who very visibly shifted their mind about something over a period of time. That's, who I, that's the kind of rebel I want to be, is someone who, who does learn in public, who, who is able to take feedback and not have my ego be, be so tender that it, it gets bruised into silence. Um, so that feels like a really important piece of it to me. I actually want to read some Courtney Martin words, too. This is yeah. such a beautiful line of yours. Um, from your book, uh, Do It Anyway, our charge is not to save the world after all. It is to live in it flawed and fierce, loving and humble. Um, I wanted to ask, I asked Parker if he would bring a poem to read to finish, and you brought a couple, so you get to choose. Um, I don't know, I think, um, I think poetry is maybe a kind of rebellion against prose that you know, helps keep language alive again and again. And notice he's reading it off of a newfangled device. <laughs> He's got an iPhone. I was actually trying to post on my Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I so, uh, there I chose a bunch of stuff, but the one that feels most right to me is a brief meditation by Victoria Safford. It's called Hope. I think that's a very important word in this conversation, and I think to hold hope these days is to be a rebel. Hope by Victoria Safford. Our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism, which are somewhat narrower, nor the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak on shrill and angry hinges, nor the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything is going to be all right but a very different, sometimes very lonely place. The place of truth-telling about your own soul, first of all, and its condition. The place of resistance and defiance. 
the piece of ground from which you see the world both as it is and as it could be, as it might be, as it will be, the place from which you glimpse not only struggle, but joy in the struggle. And we stand there, all of us, beckoning and calling, telling people what we are seeing, asking people what they see. Thank you, Parker Palmer, Courtney Martin, and thank you again, PopTech, for letting us have this conversation here. Yes, thank you.